Okay, so I'm I'm trying to find a I'm trying to find you guys a photo of me in middle school. Apparently it's more difficult. I've wiped them off the internet, but good for you. Lucky you, I found one. Okay, this, this is me in middle school. Apparently the only photo I have is where I've cut out half of my family. But the most important part is I'm still here. So I wanna introduce you though, because I cut them out of this photo, I wanna introduce you to the rest of my family. And it, apparently, we just take photos at weddings. I don't know why. I don't know why we can't just say, hey, let's take a family photo. No, 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 no. Somebody has to get married. Don't care who, maybe an aunt, maybe an uncle, maybe a cousin. Family photos only at weddings. See, see, my, my entire family. Oh, don't you guys look great. It's because you're at a wedding. Everybody's dressed up. This is not how we normally look. Really, it's usually kind of more of a, uh, a mess. But I'll tell you more. So I don't know what your family's like. My family, I think, is hilarious. And I'll tell you, there's one, there's one thing that I remember from when I was in middle school. I remember when my dad used to pick me up from youth group. And my dad, one year for Christmas, got a harmonica. You might know what a harmonica is. I don't know. It's the little, it's the musical instrument where you go, <laughs> insert a sound clip of harmonica here. Anyway, so it's a harmonica. You might know what that is, maybe you don't. But it's this musical instrument. You can like just walk around and play it. It's pretty easy. But I would be at youth group and it like things would be wrapping up. I'm having fun, hanging with my friends. And then slowly throughout the halls, you start to hear a noise. What's that? It's the sound of a harmonica. Looks like my dad's here to pick me up. And my friends would go, hey Tyler, I think your dad's here. And I would go, yeah, I hear a harmonica. And that's how I knew that my dad was coming to pick me up from youth group. There would just be a harmonica in the hallway as if that was like a totally normal thing. Now, that might annoy some of you, but I thought it was the funniest thing. I love it. Now, I'm betting you probably have some stories about family too. And I've been wondering what that looks like for the rest of my friends too. So I kind of asked around. So one of my family traditions is that um, my sisters and I are all named Jean and I'm Korean and so we have like a, there's like a particular naming pattern that all the kids get. My name is actually Jean Sun. My younger sister's name is Jean Young and my older sister's name is Jean Na. But whenever anyone would call our home phone, and my mom would pick up and they'd be like, oh, you know, we want, uh, can I talk to Jean? And my mom would say, well, which gene do you want to talk to? And they would be on the other end like, gene, like wh what other gene is there? And 99% of the time, the person on the other end would just hang up because they're just so confused. So, yeah. Okay, so we use aunt and uncle nicknames like a lot of families do. And somehow my name is Stuart and I ended up with the uncle nickname Tutu. Who wants to have you have an uncle nickname that's Tutu? That is a, you know, a dancing thing. But anyway, that's who I am. To all my nieces and nephews, I am Tutu. So in my family, we use lots and lots of nicknames. As a matter of fact, my mom actually calls me Mama Mia, and I call her Baby. So one of the traditions when I was a kid that my family would do to celebrate New Year's, we would cook a whole hog and we would have what is called a pig picket and it would be drenched in vinegar barbecue sauce because that's what we did in North Carolina. So something unique about my family, our um, last name is Bohintz. And growing up, every time we would go out to a restaurant to eat and we would put our name in, what's the thing up front called? The host! For some reason, and I don't know where, why this started or where, but we would always go by the name Green, which all of us in the family knew, but whenever somebody was joining our family for dinner and they'd be like, Green, party of six, and we would all stand up, our friends or whoever was joining us for dinner would kind of look at us like, I thought your last name was Bohens, but I guess it was because it was like hard to pronounce or something. <laughs> See, I'm not the only one. And I bet that's true of you too. And that's kind of the thing about your fam, or, you know, fam is short for family. That's how the cool kids say family. 
But that's like the thing about your fam. They can make you crazy, they can embarrass you, but they can also be the ones cheering the loudest in the stands. They can get on your nerves, they can be some of the strangest people you know, and you can still love them, you can still love being around them. They can be some of the most encouraging, loving, and supportive people in your life. Now, here's the thing. I know not everyone likes being around their fam. And that's because family can be stressful, unpredictable, even exhausting at times. Fighting, health issues, divorce, lying, rules, all these things and more can kind of make family a lot more complicated. Now, add faith to that equation. Believe it or not, faith, what each of you believes or doesn't believe, can make things even more complicated with your fam. Whether you've been a Christian for a long time or this Jesus thing is really new to you, here's what I would want you to know, faith can create tension in your family. Maybe you already know this is true because your faith is really important to you. What you believe influences the way you live and the way you live impacts your family. And that's complicated because you have a parent or a step-parent or a sibling who doesn't see faith the same way you do. Basically, they aren't Christians and you are. Or maybe they are Christians, but they give you a hard time for taking it so seriously. And honestly, you're not sure if you're even supposed to talk about any of this faith stuff with them at all. They might believe something totally different than you, and that feels strange. It feels like you're on two different pages. Or maybe for you, faith impacts your fam in a different way. Because in your home, it's your mom or foster parent or grandparent who is really into this Jesus stuff. They love reading their Bible, they love going to church, and they think you should love it too. And if you're honest, you aren't all that interested. In fact, maybe you're here because somebody in your family made you come. Maybe they forced you to come to church because they want you to believe what they believe. Or maybe they send you to church as punishment for something you did that they think a little faith could fix. Now, if that's you, faith is certainly making things in your family a lot more complicated. Or maybe, here's another one, you aren't really sure about how your family and faith mix. Maybe you've always said you believed because your parents told you to. But as you get older, you're not so sure what you really think. But still, you're told to honor your parents. But the truth is, you don't always get a lot of choice in the matter, do you? So you keep going through the motions, but inside, you're kind of struggling. And because you can't talk to your family about it, it's making some things at home feel a little bit different. Do you see what I mean? Like, in one way or another, faith can create tension in our families, which is confusing, because we're also told that faith is somehow supposed to make things better in our fam. But that doesn't always seem true, does it? So the question is, if faith can create tension in our families, how do we make sure faith is actually helping to make our families better? Pause, stop, break, good news. I think I might have an answer to that question. Technically, it's not my answer to that question. It's actually something Jesus said. And a guy named John, one of Jesus' closest friends and followers, wrote it down so that we could learn from it today. Now. Before I tell you exactly what Jesus said that John wrote down, let me explain a little bit about what was happening before he said it. So just before Jesus was going to be arrested and eventually killed on the cross, he called his close friends and followers together for a meal. Now, even though Jesus warned them that he was gonna die, they didn't really understand. It didn't click with them that this was going to be the last meal they shared together as a fam. To them, they were just doing what they always did as a family. They were like kicking back, Someone's making pizza. Someone's talking about how their how their day was. I don't know. They they were just they were talking, having a good time, sharing a meal, talking about life. But because Jesus knew the way things were about to go down, he wanted to share a few really important words with his closest people. So at that dinner, he dropped this important truth to his fam. And not like literally his family, but his close people. You know what I mean. So he said, "By this Everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Now, this word disciples here, it just means that, that you follow Jesus. Jesus was saying that people will know we follow him and believe in him by the way we love each other. Jesus knew that difficult times were coming. He knew that this wasn't just a fun meal and that things were gonna get harder that his friends would get scared, persecuted, and even tempted to turn their back on him. Yet, when it all came down to it, Jesus took this one last opportunity to remind them that loving each other was the most important thing they could do. Loving each other was the way they could show the world that they believed in him. Loving each other was the way their faith could make an impact. I think that the same can be true 
of our families. If we want faith to do more than create tension in our family, if we want it to actually impact our families for the better, then it's not about winning them to our side. It's not about convincing each other to believe the same thing or arguing about what's true or right. It's just about love. Because loving your family is how your faith can make an impact. Now, this isn't easy. Let me be clear, this isn't easy. Loving your family the way Jesus asks can be so difficult, really difficult. In fact, some days it might be the hardest thing you're called to do, but I think Jesus knew that. I think that's why he didn't leave us to figure out how to do it on our own. So a few years later, God led a guy named Paul to write a bunch of letters to churches to instruct and encourage them in their faith. They were living after Jesus' death and resurrection, and honestly, most of them were a lot like me and probably a lot like you. They were people just trying to figure out how this whole faith thing impacts the different parts of their lives. And in one of the letters, Paul laid out for them and us exactly what this looks like to love others. He said this, love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking, it is not easily angered, it keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. When Jesus calls us to love one another, this is what he's actually asking us to do. To be patient, kind, humble, respectful, and selfless. To not get upset easily or hold grudges. To protect and trust and hope and stick it out with the people around us. To love our fam the way Jesus calls us to love them. So you probably see this by now, but loving your family is how your faith can make an impact. Love is where it starts. So no matter what you believe or what your family believes when it comes to faith, this is something we can all do. We can all try and love the people in our fam just a little bit more. If you're doing it because you believe in Jesus, that's great. But if you're not so sure that you believe in Jesus, trying to love your fam can still make things better. Let's talk about this week. Here's what I would want you to think about. What does it look like to love your family? It could mean being patient and kind to the adults in your home. You could not be arrogant or like act like you know everything when you talk about your beliefs with your family members who believe something different. To not be jealous of what your siblings have. To not be rude to your mom. Not to be hot tempered or quick to react with your stepdad. Whatever it is, give it a try this week. I bet you can do it. And to help you not get overwhelmed, start by just picking one. That's all I'm asking you to do, just one. Pick one of the ways that you can show love that Paul listed out in that letter that we just read. Start there. Just focus on that one. Maybe for me, I, I probably need some patience. I need to try that this week. But try it and you will see that love is how our faith makes our family better. Because honestly, love is what changes people. Love is what faith is all about. Even if it doesn't change them, it can change you. I know, that's a big thought. All right. If you remember nothing about everything I've just said between harmonica, family photos, all that, remember this, loving your family is how your faith can make an impact. We're gonna continue this conversation in groups. Actually, in a lot of ways, groups are sort of like your fam here at church. A safe place for you to open up, ask questions, and share some of what you're going through with people who love you and want what's best for your life. So. As we head to groups, I want you to think about this question. What's one way, just one way, I can show my family love this week?